Hi, everyone. So we're going to do something a little different today. And I want you to listen to a story. <laughs> it is coming from an alternate perspective. So there is a doctrine in Christianity that is completely false. And none of Christianity knows that. So we're going to look at things completely opposite. We're going to see Jesus for who he truly is. If I need to bring in scripture, of course I will do that. Um, But first, Christianity has the idea of original sin. The Bible teaches against that. And I have many videos on this. Um, If you want to believe in original sin, you can do that. But let's try to have a positive perspective. Let's try to see human beings as beautiful creations. Um, that God made man perfect just the way he is. That everybody has a chance to be Christ-like. That babies, when they're knit together in the womb with love and tender care by God, are innocent Of course, the Bible says you must be like a child to enter the gates of heaven. And this is because children are innocent. They are born pure. They see the beauty of life. So we're going back to that perspective. We are going back to the garden. We are going back to Genesis 1 where God had just made everything In all of creation, everything is listed there. And what does God say at the end? And God saw everything that he had made, including human beings. And behold, it was very good. We are going to look at the world as a good place, original garden that God declared it was good in the beginning. Also, John 1.9 is a beautiful Um, representation of Genesis 1 also, because it tells us that God was with the word together. And we call the word Jesus Christ. The same was in the beginning with God. This is why, uh, possibly, Genesis 1 says, let us make man in our image. It's the word together with God. Okay. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Were you made? Yes, you were. Was your neighbor made? Yes, he was. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. If you have life, you have light. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. That is very true. So, then John the Baptist comes to declare the light. He, John was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light, the word, Jesus, which lights every man that comes into the world. Every man that is born to life has the light. Change your opinion right now, Christianity, because we all know that by the law, of God, you look and you judge people as sinful. You don't see the light. You see sin. You see sin in the world. You see darkness encroaching. You see horrible things going on out there, and it's because men are evil. Well, if we, if you were in the garden, everything was very good. It, it stressed very good, not just good, but very good. And every man has the light of Christ. Where? Where is this light? Why do we only see evil? It's because we have the wrong perspective. You see, unto the pure, all things are pure. There are people out there who have the innocence of a child. And they are looking at the world with rose-colored glasses. It's beautiful, wonderful out there. Everything looks pristine and pure. Everything doesn't matter what's happening out there, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, right? You don't believe the word. You don't believe the light that lights every man is nothing pure. Nothing's pure. Therefore, you're looking at evil. You are living in hell. You are not in the garden. 
If you're in the garden, everything is pure, everything is good, there's light everywhere, and you detect it no matter what. If you don't believe in Christ, and if you are defiled, everything looks evil, so judge yourself right now. How do things look? That's how you're going to determine if your conscience is defiled. And I will tell you truly, it has been defiled because you live in this world. Your conscience is defiled. It doesn't start out that way, but it has been twisted by the serpent. Twisted by the serpent. So let's look at the Bible as after Genesis 3. Adam and Eve have taken of the serpent's fruit. They have become twisted. What happens to the world in Genesis 3? God says, instead of this beautiful garden, the world is going to appear to produce thorns and thistles. This is Adam's curse for eating the fruit and getting twisted in the mind. He can't see goodness anymore. He can't see light. He can't see the garden. He sees thorns. He sees thistles. This is his curse. From Genesis 3 forward, the serpent takes over the mind. Everything written. Almost. There's little pieces of good in in there, but there is certainly a lot of evil in the Old Testament. And if you don't know that, you don't know Jehovah. He can be evil, vengeful, wicked, murderous. Okay? Now, what does a little bit of leaven do? Leavens the whole lump. And so to find the truth in that evil darkness, leaven, yeast, is very hard to do. And so actually you should probably throw the whole thing out because there is evil mixed in with the good. And of course I showed you that in the last video. Um, what happens eventually is that God makes a covenant with the people, but it's not God. You are living in, where does he take them? To the wilderness of sin. He takes them to the wilderness of sin. Where Mount Sinai is, it's the desert. It's not the garden. Jehovah meets them in the desert. Exodus 16. All the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. Sinai and Sin. The words are the same if you look at the concordance right here. 55.12 and 55.14. They come from the same root. You are going into the wilderness of sin where all the thorns and thistles and desert, hot sun, dead sea, salty waters, abyss. This is what happens to the Israelites. They are deceived by the serpent and they don't know it. And of course, I've shown this a million times on the channel. Okay. They go into the desert and they wander for 40 years. They don't know where they are going. In the desert, they develop some nasty habits. And it's because with every turn, they're drinking bitter water. They are being swallowed up by earthquakes. They are being smote by Jehovah and killed instantly. And so what does this do to a people? It creates fear. Wait a minute. Perfect love casts out fear. Well, not when you're living under Jehovah. When at any drop of the hat, he can kill you. Okay? He sets them to war in the book of Joshua. He sets these followers of her his. Let me tell you what happened to them in the desert, okay? The desert sand 
Thorns and Thistles is literally an arena. The word arena in, I'm not sure if it's Greek. Literally, it means sand. No, I didn't want that. It means sand. So in the sand, there is an arena. It really becomes a competition. Why? Because you are out for the survival of the most righteous and most holy and most fit. You know that if you're not good enough, you are doomed, right? You know the stonings that occur, the exile, the death that occurs, the pestilence, everything occurs if you aren't good enough. It becomes a struggle for the survival of the fittest in the desert. It's an arena. It's a competition. It's a sport. It's a challenge. It's a game. It's a heated over drive of survival instinct. Okay. The hunt. It's the hunt. It's the thirst. It's the thirst for being good enough, being the best, overcoming your obstacles, surviving itself. This is what happens in the arena. Right here. Latin, arena, sand, sandy place, sanded for combat. And of course, that is what Jehovah has the Israelites doing constantly, fighting other nations, fighting other nations. Okay, so let's start to look at those people. And it's, it's, not their fault, okay? When you live in those conditions, you would become that way too. Blood thirsty. Out to kill your competitor because you have to be at the top or you risk judgment, death, exile, and stoning. You will get lost in the desert, okay? So imagine these people now. They've become wild, savage. They are pumped up on adrenaline the entire time. We're not going to have enough food. We're in the desert. We're not going to be able to provide for our families. Some person is going to come and try to be better than me. I have all of these holy relics here. Um, Somebody's going to steal them from me. Then I won't be pleasing to Jehovah. I have to offer my tithes, and yet my I'm not producing anything. I have to sacrifice. I have to serve him. You are hopped up on adrenaline the entire time. Okay, they have literally become beasts. Um, it's the unevolved man. It's the caveman thinking, only thinking about survival. Only thinking about survival, the basic needs of humanity. Okay? Okay, so what does Jehovah do? He sends these demons in to conquer the holy land, the promised land. People were living there. He sends Joshua in. The first conquest is Jericho. He sends people in and he says, kill them all. Take the spoil. Keep it for yourself. This is the land I'm giving you. He's giving them the garden, the promised land. The promised land. In come these demons to overtake the promised land. It's exactly what happened to them. Demons came in. In the garden, the serpent came in and cursed them when they were in the abundant, fertile garden. Serpents came out of the desert, bit everybody, and killed them all. 
Okay, that that is what law, that is what listening to an outside authority does to you. Um, it has you wandering, and it becomes it becomes a um, competition because what are the Christians? They are the elect and the chosen. And we're doing everything right. And we're praising God and we're singing songs to him and we're saying our prayers and we're doing all this stuff and we're holy. We're pleasing to him. You have to stay on top though. You're always in fear. You're always walking on eggshells. Don't slip up because God won't be pleased. Okay. It's the survival instinct again. And that's all adrenaline that is not peace. It's the opposite of peace. Okay, it's the whole story. What has come in to Christianity is uh, uh, wrong thinking, doctrines of devils, doctrines of devils. We are the elect and chosen, so we have every right to the promised land and nobody else can have it. And we're going to step on all of you to get there. We're going to judge you. We're going to stay away from you. We won't be equally yoked. We've, it's fear. It's fear of everybody. Huddle together, Christians, because these people, if they touch you, they're going to defile you. No, it's the other way around. You touch people and you're defiling them. What are you doing? When you go preach this doctrine to other people, they are selling their soul to the devil. You're serving the devil in the wilderness, the serpent has deceived you. You're sacrificing everything for him. You're tithing. You're obeying. You're obedient. All of it is selling your soul to the devil. You say, if I do this for you, let me in to heaven. That's a covenant with the devil. Your father, the devil, is why Jesus called the Pharisees, who are now the Christians, Serpents, generation of vipers. They still believe the doctrines from the thorny, dry, desert, dead sea land. Okay. So you need to put a spin on things. The riddles of the Bible, if you could just think clearly without the indoctrination, you realize, wait. These Hebrews were not the best people. I'm so sorry. Um, I will tell you why they're innocent despite all of that. It's because you will never, ever, ever blame a person who's indoctrinated or deceived for their actions. Ever, ever. They forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. A little child who accidentally smacks another kid but didn't realize that it was going to cause pain and suffering and tears to come out. And so what can you do to the child who did not understand? Nothing. You forgive them. You don't exile them. You don't set them to hellfire. You don't curse them. You forgive them. Okay, all are forgiven. It's just the mind was unrenewed. It was caveman thinking. The Bible says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Get out of these doctrines of devils. Ye are transformed by the renewing of your mind. Christianity thinks that they're not conformed to this world, but of course they follow laws from an outside authority, just like all humans do under government law. What you're supposed to listen to is the authority inside your heart and inside your mind and not the authority in the book, not the authority of the covenant, the legal contracts, the bondage, the binding. Okay, so this, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In the Bible, it's called enlightenment and Christianity fears that movement so 
tremendously enlightenment. All oh, it's all new age, you know, not of God. No. No, it's quite the opposite. Jesus was the most enlightened, which is why he said, I'm the light of the world. And his doctrine astonished the Pharisees. Okay, because it was different than their scripture. Okay, so the unrenewed mind is the first man, Adam, sown in corruption. So it's okay. It's a process of evolution. So the first man, Adam, was a living soul. That's unevolved caveman-like thinking, indoctrination, deceived by the serpent. All of humanity is under the beast system. All are deceived by the beast system. The last man, Adam, is a quickening spirit. Okay? Um, so we're sown in corruption, but then when you resurrect, you are raised in incorruption, and you won't think that way anymore. Okay? The world becomes a beautiful garden again. And that's because Jesus brought us the kingdom. The time is fulfilled, Jesus said. The kingdom is at hand. So Jesus brought us the kingdom. It's just understanding how to renew your thinking, come out of the indoctrination of law, religion, and believe, see, and saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Believing that instead of living in hell in the thorny, a fruitless desert where you wander for your entire life, believing instead in the garden that's all around you. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next video.